Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Shelf Life Part 2, Fundamentals and Study Designs. We're happy to have you here with us today. My name is Jessica, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Sales here at Amtec, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. First off, we encourage everyone to participate by asking questions throughout the presentation. You can submit questions by clicking Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll save some time at the end to go over the questions that came through. We'll also be recording today's webinar, which will be made available on our website. To start off, for those of you who don't know, Amtec is an accredited laboratory in the San Francisco Bay Area, specializing in routine food safety testing and special research projects such as shelf life, challenge, process validation, and investigation studies. Today's webinar will be presented by Drs. Eric Wilhelmsen and Heidi Wright. Dr. Wilhelmsen is a recognized authority in food spoilage, shelf life extension, risk management, and quality improvement. Dr. Heidi Wright is Amtec's Research Laboratory Director, who's in charge of designing all shelf life studies here at Amtec. Dr. Wright is an expert in food spoilage, shelf life evaluation, and natural antimicrobials in food and pharmaceuticals. And with that, let's get started. Eric? Well, it's good morning for me. I don't know where all of you other participants are, but we're gonna go through some of the important things about shelf life. We have a number of questions that become obvious when you take a subject like this. Obviously, if we're gonna talk about it, we should define shelf life. Um, we're gonna talk about how a product can fail. And then I'll be turning the time over to Heidi who will talk about some of these other more practical questions. The concept of shelf life is one that is often oversimplified in people's minds because, well, it's not a simple point in time. I mean, generally products age out of shelf life. That's what we're mostly familiar with but there's a small portion of products that must age before their true shelf life begins. I mean, they're more valuable. Parmesan cheese is one that most of us encounter, it's an example. Um, people advertise age 90 days and this kind of thing. And of course, fine wine, most people know about. But there's another icky aspect of this there's rarely a sharp transition between good and unacceptable. The degradation rate of a product determines its shelf life. So this simple chart, we have desirability on the left, time on the bottom, and we can conceptualize shelf life is when the quality um, ceases to be acceptable. But in reality, um, shelf life is ultimately determined by the customer and then for the consumer. Um, essentially, by definition, the marketplace is right. If you're trying to sell something you think is still good, but the consumers won't buy it, well, then it's out of shelf life. Um, but we have another confusion. I'm sure many of you have seen that basket of strawberries aging in your refrigerator. It doesn't all go moldy at the same time. Usually there's that first berry that start getting fuzzy. So has that basket of strawberries reached the end of its shelf life? Maybe, maybe not. Um, even processed foods have this problem that the, all the units don't age at the same rate or fail at the same time. So very often a shelf life must include a percentage metric um, with regards to what portion is still acceptable. Many of you may have had a tub of leafy greens and wanted to get that one more salad out of it and sorted the good lettuce out. 
Well, again, was the tub of lettuce past its shelf life? Well, you made a salad from it. Um, cherry picking the best units for a product claim is not a winning strategy in general because your customers may buy it once, but then they're not happy. Another complication is that products can have more than one shelf life. If your household is like mine, um, you buy some partially ripened bananas, they're good as fruit for a few days, and then we toss them in the freezer for making a banana cake later when they get a little bit too ripe. So we have more than one purpose and there's more than one shelf life. And the freezer they'll keep for many weeks. Um, when you have more than one user, you can also have more than one shelf life. In broccoli, for example, if you keep it too long in your refrigerator, the little flowerettes will open. It starts looking yellow. That makes it unappealing as a fresh vegetable, but it still make a very nice soup. And commercially, people using it as ingredient for something might not be troubled by the opening, but nobody likes it when it gets black mold. So you can have degrees of failure in a desired attribute or differences in failure mode, all of which complicate defining shelf life. Um, we have two big categories that um, basically limit shelf life. There is the safety aspect and um, hurting people is not acceptable. We have microbial growth doing this, toxins causing illness, um, off flavors. These are safety issues. And then the other side is quality or customer satisfaction. This is when the product ceases to provide the desired benefits. All right, always trying to put structure into things and organize it. We have three big classes of failure. Failure in storage, things that just fail because of the product, and sometimes people make mistakes. Got a list of things here that people can mess up and they'll make product that has inferior or very limited shelf lives. You can see these swollen cans and I automatically think of hydrogen swells, but we could also have something like um, a bacterial spoilage. Um, don't know, but those are pretty swollen cans. But anyway, when you look at failures in execution, starting with the wrong stuff, um, not enough or inadequate process, mixing the cook times, um, leaving the product hot too long. If you have more flexible packages or packages that breathe a little bit, you can get post-process contamination. Um, don't see it so much now, but when cans first started, double seam execution was problematic. Still, sometimes you'll see fractures in the double seam. Um, and failures in sanitation. This is especially problematic when you have um, product consumed fresh without a kill step. Very familiar with the problem 
and value added salads. But anyway, so we can have shelf life limited by just not doing something right. We have failures in storage and transportation. These are mostly environmental. You can read through them. And just because I like exceptions, um, once upon a time was working on a sorbet product and the packaging failed during shipping. It was all being manufactured in the LA basin. And then it was being shipped across the country and all the packaging failed when it was being shipped to the Midwest. What was happening is the sorbet would expand as you drove over the mountains. So the problem was not enough atmospheric pressure. So kind of an exception to this list, but that's the way shelf life is. Um, it doesn't always fit into these nice categories that we try and structure. But the most common things still are temperature, humidity, oxygen, and light that are these sorts of failures. And then we have things that are intrinsic to the product. Sometimes products just age and become less acceptable. You can get physical changes, chemical changes, microbial changes. Those bananas we started with, with multiple shelf lives, if you keep them on your counter just too long, they do eventually become unsuitable for anything except maybe composting for your garden. So um, we have to be mindful that sometimes products have inherent failures because of their composition and metabolism. And um, rather than taking time here, I'll refer you to Shelf Life Part 1 on the website where Florence has talked at length about many of the microbiological mechanisms of failure. <coughs> um, failure mechanisms there are as numerous as the bacteria. Now, we have a problem. Here's a nice pretty slide of lots of different kinds of food. In our personal experience, we can think about things that would spoil each of these products. Just gonna take just a quick tour through a whole bunch of chemical mechanisms. Gonna give you an example and talk at you for a couple minutes, but senescence. This is basically when a product that was li living like most food runs out of energy. And so it just dies and decays in front of you. So that banana that I just talked about that was beyond use for um, even banana bread, or that lettuce in the bottom of the tub. Um, when a food product senesces, it no longer has energy to maintain its integrity and structure. Overripening is related to senescence, except in this case, um, the ripening process releases enzymes that promote the softening and all that. But those enzymes don't stop just because the product gets to where you want it to be. So that peach that you put out to 
ripen and get soft. Well, it just keeps getting softer until it just mushes up when you touch it. Rancidity, this is the reaction of lipids. You have auto-oxidation and peroxidation. And this can give you fruity off flavors and things as diverse as potato chips or um, canned seafood. Loss of vitamins is one of those hidden modes of failure. But if you're claiming a vitamin claim on something like a juice product or other fortified product, um, vitamins A, C, and E are subject to oxidation. And some of the other vitamins react also with different mechanisms. And your product becomes misbranded if it doesn't have the declared vitamins. Condensation reactions, these are more complex, but generally what you're getting is browning and cooked off flavors. The easiest example is something like an apple juice in glass. You leave it in your pantry for a year and come back to it instead of a nice golden color. It's now brown and you say, oh, maybe it'll taste good. You taste it, it'll have this kind of cooked burn taste just because it has had too long to react. Color change. Um, this can be caused by a lot of things, but um, there are a lot of pigments that oxidize and bleach. Degradation of proteins. This is usually a textural problem. Things can start weeping and losing water. Press me, almost done. Photochemical, light can take the color out of things by just bleaching it. Um, so you have something that's a nice pretty red color and you put it on the shelf and you think, oh, it's essentially sterile. I have six months, a year of shelf life, but it gets in the bright lights of the grocery store and it fades. Very unacceptable. Scaling mostly relates to high carbohydrate products. You're restructuring starch grains and they're recrystallizing and you don't have the nice texture of the products. Last one, decarboxylation. This is kind of an exotic reaction, but it can cause cans to swell like those mandarin oranges we saw. That's the last one. I um, want to take you through an example just to give you an idea of the complexity. Um, we're going to condense into maybe five minutes what was, oh, eight months to a year of research. Um, you're going to get the digest, not all the um, dead ends and things we explored. This is one of personal experience. We're talking about a vitamin C fortified pasteurized juice blend packed in a gable top carton. The cartons pictured here are three or four generations beyond what I was working with back when this happened. The screw caps is an innovation that occurred about two years after the period we're talking about, which really simplified things a lot for these kinds of products. You can now seal the gable top, that's the fold at the top, 
really well because you don't have to peel it open. Some of you may be old enough to remember peeling back cartons of juice or milk to get that pore spout. Well, these screw cap closures made that so it wasn't important. Anyway, this product is heated then cooled prior to sanitary filling in these containers. We ran lots of storage studies and the results were contradictory, contradictory and initially very confu confusing because there were multiple failure mechanisms involved. <clears throat> the first problem was not meeting the vitamin C claims. You can read through the details here. We had a new multi-layered foil laminate structure that was supposed to be an oxygen barrier. We initially fortified at 140% of the claim, which when you heated it up, dropped to the distribution you see in that darkest line at the top. But we had a small percentage of product that just didn't meet shelf life. It was increasingly um, failing faster. And when we needed to be 100% of claim at the end of shelf life, going from a 40 day claim to 60 days just wasn't happening. And yet, if we packed the product in a glass container, we easily made the 60 day shelf life. So we had a problem. We had two other sets of problems. <clears throat> the microbial failure was sporadic. Um, the same lots of raw materials didn't grow the same organisms in shelf life studies. The, growth typically occurred in a small portion of the products by 40 days, but in the ones that didn't spoil in the short time, just didn't fail. <clears throat> then we had another class of failures when we were running these cartons. Sometimes we got these off flavors about 25% of the time, tasters detected this. Maybe some of them got even ill. Jumping to the chase on this, it may be easy to see. Don't know if you did with the quick review I gave you. The foil layer fractured some of the time, and this happened in the fifth fold where the seaming was done most often. And if the foil was cracked, it leaked oxygen. That was the problem with the vitamin C. Um, the cartons got contaminated in transit because they were not being kept critically clean. And so the solution for that was to wrap them up and then sterilize them because some of the cartons got strange and exotic molds on them. So when we put them together and put this pasteurized juice in it, these molds just flourished. And the new polymers in this, they outgassed after manufacturing. So all we had to do was hold the cartons for about a month before we used them and we didn't have that problem. Now, why did we go through all this torture and agony? Well, I just wanted to highlight that a product can have more than one failure mode that is active. Controlling the critical mode of failure may just change the mode of failure. And the effort to extend a shelf life of a product can involve lots of players and be complex. 
And just because it's an unusual um, situation, once upon a time, there were cans of crushed pineapple blowing up in the Middle East. There was no microbial growth under any conditions. It wasn't a hydrogen swell. Well, the cause was a rare decarboxylation reaction. The one I told you doesn't occur very often. And so you have to recognize when the expected is rejected, the cause is what is left. And with that, I'll turn this over to Heidi. Perfect. So thank you, Eric. That was great background information that we will now use as the basis for discussion as we transition to talking about shelf life study design. So essentially, what is a shelf life study? It is the examination, um, examining the performance of a product over time. And this is achieved by evaluating certain product parameters, kind of the modes of failure um, under documented storage conditions. And one of the key items about shelf life studies is that they need to be customized for each product. So um, it's gonna be for each product, each study goal, and potentially each phase of the product development, you're going to need a, a customized shelf life study. So we cannot use the same design or the same methods for all products. And that is where having a customized study design is very, is very important as the first step in the process. So there are many reasons for performing a shelf life study with those listed here being some of the key reasons. So for example, you want to have an accurate expiration date uh, from both a safety as well as a quality perspective. You want to ensure the product retains its quality for the client and to protect your brand. You don't want to recall for a product failing prior to shelf life. Um, and then that's essentially what consumers associate with your brand name. Preliminary shelf life studies can be done um, on any new formulation or you have a packaging change um, and you don't want that to impact the, the shelf life or quality of the product. So essentially, if customers have a specific product that they have come to know and really like, you, you don't want to make any changes that is going to um, you know, alter what the customer thinks of your product. And then as we continue with the product after launch, Additional shelf life studies can be conducted periodically, um, essentially to confirm that the product continues to meet your acceptability standards. So there are a number of times um, at which a shelf life study should and could be completed. So this would be during product formulation um, and essentially prior to a new product launch. So when you're formulating your product, running through different iterations, you can run you know, a shelf life study, sometimes multiple shelf life studies. Um, and then you, know, you run a full shelf life study prior to that product launch. So you have um, you know, a shelf life and an expiration date for your product. Also, you know, when you make changes to formulation, a process, if you're looking at changing different ingredients, um, suppliers, maybe you're looking at you know, changing out a preservative system, you're gonna to want to run additional shelf life studies at that time. Packaging can have a big impact on the overall product shelf life, um, other sort of storage conditions. So anytime, anytime you um, change anything like that, you're gonna to want to run some additional shelf life studies. If there's ever a consumer complaint um, or a product failure prior to the stated shelf life. So you're going to want to maybe do a spoilage investigation or figure out the cause of it, kind of like Eric referred to in some of the case studies. And then you would want to run a, another shelf life study to confirm that you are back to kind of meeting your shelf life for your product. And then we get asked a lot if we only have to do a shelf life study once. So even after the product launches, we have a shelf life study, we have a shelf life for it. Um, it's still recommended to um, perform, you know, shelf life study every once in a while, just to ensure that continued product acceptability. So here's a more detailed look at shelf life during the different product development stages. Uh, so we kind of talked about when you should run shelf life studies, and this kind of breaks out, you know, the type of shelf life and what we'd be looking for at each of these different stages. 
So during product formulation, you're running the pilot trials. This might be where you're doing some risk, risk assessment of looking at different ingredients, um, at different systems in the product. Um, and you would want to run some different iterations of shelf life studies during this time. This is also where you really want to determine kind of what your potential failure mechanisms could be for your product. And that's at the same time, you know, determining what indicator the indicators those could be and the acceptance limits, because those are going to be very important as you get to your full scale and then your continued shelf life testing. Once you kind of have that um, product formulation ready um, and you've done those initial shelf life studies, you would move on to, with that product to the commercial scale production. And that's when a lot of other things are happening. You have food safety plan, HACCP, process validation if needed. And then this is where that full shelf life study design comes into, into focus. So you use the information that you generated from those preliminary trials. So what are we gonna test for? What are our acceptability limits? And those are all included in that full scale shelf life study. So once you get that um, expected shelf life during this commercial um, phase, you're ready for launch and you already have your the shelf life for your product, the expiration date. And then once the product is launched, this is when you would do regular shelf life evaluation, you know, spoilage investigation, if there was, if that ever happened to be an issue for your product, and then do um, some of the routine shelf life evaluation as the product is in the market. So designing a shelf life study involves a similar set of questions and steps, um, no matter the stage of production of the product. Um, but the answers sometimes to those questions could vary based on the developmental stage. So if you're in the preliminary stage, you might not know what some of those modes of failure would be or the acceptability limits. So you would still ask the same questions. And this is what we would do during initial shelf life inquiry meeting. We would kind of talk through some of these topics. Um, so we'd identify what might be those modes of failure. What do we need to test for? Is this going to be potentially chemical testing? Are we going to look at microbial testing? Would it be more a um, sensory evaluation or a combination of all of them? And then these indicators are included in the study design as well as the acceptability limits if known. If it's preliminary and we don't know them, that's kind of one of the main you know, goals of the study will be to figure out what those, you know, limits are. And then all this goes into the final design um, plan and we start monitoring the product. The product is tested, tested under the simulated conditions. So are we looking at a real-time study here, an accelerated? Um, sometimes it's going to be a combination of them. And so we're testing under those conditions. And then once we get all the results, that's what we use to analyze and predict the, the product shelf life. So one of the key items is to know and understand the modes of product failure. And so these kind of relate back to, you know, some of the items that Eric talked about um, in terms of, you know, changes that could happen in the product. And a lot of times it's going to be multiple potential modes of failure. Um, and so here we're going to go through some the different modes for different storage conditions. So there's some examples here of products as well as changes. So you can kind of think about some of the products you have and what might be some of the potential modes of failure. So for frozen foods, it's mainly related to changes in sensory of the product as you would perceive it. Um, so are we getting freezer burn? Are we getting um, ice crystallization? Are we getting clumping of the product? Um, and then you also have to think about for frozen foods, like what is that secondary shelf life? So are we, you know, is the ready to, you know, eat state of the product or ready to consume a state gonna be after the product is, you know, slacked out and thawed in the refrigerator and then it's cooked. So we need to look at evaluating potentially that secondary shelf life, especially if we're starting to see changes in the frozen product and how that relates to that endpoint for the shelf life. Um, changes in frozen foods and microbial changes are not going to be an issue um, in the frozen conditions if it's maintained at you know, frozen conditions, um, but it's going to be related to some of these other you know, sensory or oxidative reactions. 
For refrigerated foods, this is where we'll start to look at microbial changes. So this can either be visual changes if we're seeing visible yeast or mold. And is that relating to changes in the odor um, or the flavor of a product due to microbial growth? Um, enzymatic reactions and then the moisture and senescence is also something depending on the food type um, that could be a part of a refrigerated um, food mode of failure. And lastly, here is ambient foods. Um, you will see very similar modes of failure um, across the storage conditions, and there could be multiple modes of failure, as Eric said. So, you know, when you're thinking through what you need to test for, especially in those preliminary shelf life studies, you're going to want to make sure that you're encompassing the, those potential modes of failure so that you're figuring out what, you know, what is going to be that limitation. So for ambient foods, um, oxidative reaction, the non-enzymatic non, non browning, and then we also have moisture loss and physical changes. So again, you could be testing for microbial changes, um, some of the chemical changes, chemistry, as well as sensory for um, these products. So all of the modes of failure that we discussed can be tested and evaluated in different ways. So here in this table are some of the common indicators in the main categories. So we would be looking at, you know, potentially pulling from all of these as we're designing a shelf life study. So for microbial, we're a lot of times going to include the um, quality indicators. So we're, we're going to test for aerobic plate count, yeast and mold, lactic acid bacteria, if that's applicable for the product. Um, we typically do pathogen screens, depending on the you know, if it's a more risky food product, we'd be testing for those more often. Um, and then depending on the product type and potentially the packaging. So if you have a, you know, a modified atmosphere packaging or an anaerobic system, you're going to want to look for spore formers. And then if you have a uh, refrigerated product, you're going to want to include psychotrophic aerobic plate count, because um, that's a better indicator for growth of organisms, aerobic organisms under refrigerated conditions compared to just the traditional aerobic plate count. So all things to think about um, and that can be included um, from a microbial perspective. So from a chemical perspective, we can look at the stability of vitamins like vitamin C, A and E, like Eric said, are you know, prone to, to loss over time. So if you have claims, you're gonna want to make sure that you're evaluating those protein degradation, um, and then you can also test for rancidity through chemical measures of peroxide value, free fatty acids. There's also TBA rancidity. There's a number of other ones that can be used and it's really dependent on your product and the fat that could be oxidized um, in your product as to which one to include. And many times for rancidity, we also include a sensory evaluation to determine when we can pick up the off you know, odors or flavors um, and try to correlate that back to those chemical measures to see if we can use them in conjunction with each other to predict um, shelf life. And sensory, we use a lot for the quality aspects of the product. So we're looking at, you know, odor, um, color changes a lot of times, uh, textural changes, separation, and um, a lot of clients like photos. So we'll take photos of controls and then test samples at each test point. So you can really observe um, the product and how it's changing um, over the course of the shelf life. And physiochemical, so we can test for moisture. So if you have an, you know, a bakery product at Ambient, you're gonna get some moisture loss. Is it gonna result in sensory changes? Um, pH and water activity, the interaction there is important for some potentially hazardous foods. And pH in general is just a, a really good indicator to include for a lot of food types. Um, and we use that because if we're seeing any changes that are, you know, larger than natural variation, it could be indicating, you know, some microbial growth in the product or changes there. So it just leads us to start looking further as to what could be happening in the product. Another very common question is how many samples do we need to test? So if we're thinking about, you know, the lot that you have of um, a product and how large it is, if we're just pulling single samples, how representative is that of the entire population? And are we getting a good picture of everything that could be happening? So 
a lot of times it's good to do duplicates or triplicates. It's good, you know, dep depending on if you have multiple lots, you know, produced around the same time or at different times, we could start studies with multiple lots, you know, running different replicates in them. So it's really about finding the right number um, based on the phase of testing, how large, how big your lots are, so that we're not missing anything or that important changes do not go unobserved. Some additional items for a shelf life study and what to evaluate over the course of it include some of the items listed here. So we need to determine the frequency of testing. So are we gonna test weekly? Are we gonna test monthly? Or do we need to test even daily for you know, products with a shorter shelf life? or where we're really trying to you know, figure out what that endpoint is. So we need to ensure that we have enough data points that we're able to show trends. We don't want to get to the end of the study or we have a big gap in testing and there's a, a large change and then we don't know where that endpoint of shelf life was. So it really reduces the, the lack of usable data that we're gonna get out of it if we don't have enough test points. We need to establish um, baseline test point. So it's always important to have those initial results because we can kind of always compare back to them to see increases or changes and then look for acceptability limits. So we would set these or if you already have these limits, then we can know um, if we're reaching them and we're, you know, reaching the end of a product shelf life. Depending on the storage condition, it's important to test beyond the expected shelf life. So you're wanting to add that safety factor or essentially more of a worst case scenario in for, for your study. So if we have products, say held at refrigerated conditions and you're holding them around four Celsius. So this is kind of the most ideal sort of condition. Most consumer fridges are not gonna be around four Celsius. There's opening and closing. There's at the retail, there's also could be, um, you know, temperature cycling. So you're wanting to make sure that you're testing more of the worst case scenario instead of the, the ideal and optimal um, temperature for your product. So for holding at four Celsius for refrigerated products, it's best to test for 130% of the expected shelf life, um, just to add that extra um, cushion in at the end. And also um, you could hold at say more of an um, increased sort of refrigerated temperature. So if you hold that like seven Celsius, you know, that's more of a, um, more of a worst case scenario. So things to think about, um, you know, as you're evaluating what to hold products, what temperature um, and how they will be held, you know, both in transit and retail, as well as, you know, um, when the consumer has the product. And then we evaluate after each test point and we can modify the testing plan if necessary. So it's very important um, to be able to make changes as we go, especially if this is a new product and you're not sure what that, you know, mode of failure is going to be or when it's going to be, um, the ability to, you know, update as we go is important. So shelf life studies are very fluid and, you know, we can adjust as we go throughout the studies. Storage conditions are also a very important aspect um, of putting together a shelf life study design. So there's a number of different conditions that your product can be exposed to, and you're wanting to make sure that you're testing those that it's typically exposed to, but also, you know, like I said, more of a worst case scenario, if it gets hot during transit or if temperatures increase, um, all of those should kind of be factored in. So you could hold um, products at a plant, you know, that's your appropriate storage or typical storage. They could be held at a laboratory or research facility such as Amtec. Um, and we have, you know, those controlled conditions that we can put your products into. Um, they can be mimic real life. And then there's the accelerated option. So this is another very common question is, can I accelerate my, my you know, my study for my particular product? And the, and the short answer is possibly, um, but we really need to discuss, you know, the typical storage conditions of your product, if it's applicable for your product. You know, sometimes it's not applicable for a probiotic product, even if it's held at Ambient or there's different scenarios where it's not going to give you the best estimate of your shelf life. And that's the biggest thing is that it is an estimated shelf life. So it's always recommended to run that real time study for any accelerated storage condition. 
So AMTEC can help you estimate um, your shelf life through customized studies. So this is you know, what we do when anyone you know, is looking for a shelf life study, we discuss um, you know, the product goals and your product and kind of what you're looking for, where you are in the process. And then we put together a, a shelf life study design specifically for your product. We um, have options for accelerated, as I said, and real-time conditions, and we can do the customizable storage conditions. So we have options for different temperature and humidity conditions in our environmental chambers. And these allow us to do different acceleration rates. We can do a controlled ambient um, study, which I know a lot of um, products, it becomes important for, and we do have the storage conditions set up for the, the main category. So we have food products, cosmetics have their own, you know, they're typically are done at 40 C. Um, dietary supplements are also the same way. And so we have some of those conditions already set up. And we can also discuss, you know, if there's a certain one you're needing, you know, how we could work that in. And then all of the modes of failure um, and the tests associated with them um, that we've discussed are you know, capabilities that we can help you with. So sensory evaluation, we can do the chemistry testing, microbial testing, and usually it's a combination of all of these um, that we use to set up the most comprehensive um, and the best shelf life study to kind of get the answers you're looking for. And so for these shelf life studies, um, these are the things that we offer that really seem to make a difference to our clients. So first, we allow you to start the study um, right away. So there's typically no or very minimal wait time between the study design being approved um, and us being able to start the study. So as soon as you get product, you have product ready, you send it to us, you know, we will start testing and get the product set up. Um, and this is especially important for projects that, you know, are on a very tight timeline or you're really needing to start generating data. We also give you updates at each individual test point. So you're gonna get an updated certificate of analysis with the results. Um, and this allows you to track um, everything as the study progresses. Uh, we highlight changes so you know what to pay attention to and essentially allows you to have a discussion if we need to alter test points, um, you know, if we need to add additional analyses because we're seeing certain changes, we need to change the duration of the study. You know, you can definitely learn a lot about how your product is performing through these updates. And this flexibility, I think, is especially important, um, you know, when clients don't have a clear idea on how their product will perform or what that real endpoint for a shelf life will be. Next, when talking about shelf life studies, each study, um, you know, needs to be unique like the product and custom designed. So. Um, we always um, look to custom design the study based on if you have any product specifications um, and essentially to meet your, your needs for this particular study. And lastly, as with all Amtech services, you have easy access to talk to anyone. You can schedule meetings. Um, we can answer questions. You know, if you just want to kind of go through, um, you know, the results of the study, you know, we're happy to talk with you and we can make adjustments as we go so that you're getting the best understanding of how your product is um, performing and what the results mean. And so as we went through the shelf life study design, we have touched on all of these aspects of the process. Um, and so to summarize, these essentially include, initially we would, you know, collect information either through an inquiry form, a questionnaire, um, we can have a, a meeting. It's, it's really important to kind of know about your product and where you are in the process um, before um, we start working on the study design. The study then is designed using this information that's collected through these initial conversations. And this is gonna include everything from the tests we include, the initial test points um, that were kind of um, devised for the study as well as storage conditions. And then we, uh, the pr proposal is provided to the client. They're allowed to review, have input. We can make revisions. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the study is right um, for the client and is, you know, generating the information they're they're looking for. So this is where we really um, get the client's input and work to get that um, the study designed appropriately. 
So then once we have approval, um, we start testing. So we essentially conduct the shelf life study according to the plan and the plan can be fluid and change as we go. Um, and then updates are sent after each test point and conversations are had during this time. And then um, at the conclusion of the study, we discuss the predicted shelf life uh, based on the results. Um, and this is essentially the conclusion of the shelf life study and the entire process. So with that, I want to thank everyone for joining this webinar today. I hope you found it valuable. And as I mentioned, we're happy to answer questions or discuss your projects so you can reach out at any time. I will now turn it over to Jessica for questions. Thanks so much, Heidi. Let me see what questions we have here. So the first question we have, um, how do you perform shelf life testing on fresh slash refrigerated items? Are there options for accelerated testing? So um, the products most applicable for accelerated are gonna be your ambient shelf stable. Those are the ones that have the best defined parameters for acceleration. Um, refrigerated and fresh products, uh, there's, there's a, typically a reason that they're held, you know, under those temperature control to, to control, you know, different, different aspects of the potential, you know, modes of failure. So it's not ideal if the shelf life is, you know, a, a shorter shelf life, it's definitely recommended to run it at um, a real time refrigerated condition. Now there are options to run you know, at different, and we have set these up in the past to run at different, um, you know, temperatures, so different refrigerated temperatures and kind of see how the correlation goes and see if we can find the best um, temperature and how, what that essentially is, acceleration rate is. So this can be a little more costly um, and time intensive up front, but if you're really looking to run multiple studies in this way and it's some, it's, you know, potentially some development, um, of products, um, we can always discuss how to how to set something up like that. This one um, just came through, but I'm I'm gonna put it here because it's similar. Um, what about frozen items? Are there any options for that? So frozen again is one where real time testing is recommended. Um, the one option there is depending on the potential mode of failure. Um, there's the option for you know, some acceleration, maybe it's cycling of temperatures, if it's if you're looking at ice crystal formation, um, things like that. But again, it's it's going to be product dependent. And for frozen foods, it's always important to look at what that secondary shelf life is. So, you know, those can kind of be set up um, in tandem. Um, but again, we, you know, if you have a particular product in mind, you know, we can have a discussion as to, you know, what we could do for your frozen product. Okay, um, the next question is, how do you design tests to quantify sensory testing, i.e. LAB color, color meter for color? Yeah, so for sensory, um, we, a lot of times we, we discuss this very closely with the client. So if you have particular attributes that um, you're looking at and have been well-defined for your product, um, we use those. Like if you do LAB and Hunter scale for color testing, we can set that up because then you likely already have your parameters for color. And so then you can kind of monitor, you know, as we go. So that's definitely something. Um, and a lot of times it's more general in terms of, you know, we're noticing these color changes and we, you know, um, describe them, we take photos, so the sensory can be as detailed, um, you know, as you're needing, you know, even for some products, we do cooking of the product um, and do sensory in both the uncooked and the cooked state. So there's a lot of options for sensory um, and we try to tailor it as best we can for, um, for each client. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, we are on a, a budget, can we cut down on the number of analytes we test for? Are they all really necessary? 
So if they're so on a budget. A, yeah. So this would be like a case by case basis. Um, and we can definitely discuss how to still achieve the results while, you know, keeping the budget in mind. So there are certain tests that, you know, I would definitely want to include based on the product type. Um, however, we always try to work as closely as we can with the client, um, you know, to be able to get them, you know, results that are still valid and meet, you know, what they're looking for and their goals um, while maintaining their budget. So, so we do everything we can and we can, you know, have conversations about how best to achieve that. Um, you know, maybe it's preliminary studies that we, you know, figure out for one variable what we need to test for and what might be the potential modes of failure. And then, you know, we can run more, um, you know, more on different SKUs and things like that. So there's a lot that we can do. And, um, you know, we definitely try to, to work with the clients. Um, the next question is, if I have a product that's very similar, but it has a different flavor, do I need to do a study for that too? And how do I, how do I know and why? I think is, I think if yeah, there's multiple so, flavors, how do you know okay. if you need to do a, a study? Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, each essentially formulation and flavor should at some point be tested. It's definitely recommended to do it. Um, and it will depend on the stage of product development. Um, but many times, if a client has a lot of them, we can start with, uh, there can be like a worst case scenario product. So if there's um, a product with, you know, a certain pH or different um, ingredients that might make it more of a worst case scenario, we could start with that and try to figure out, you know, the best, you know, analyses to include and, you know, get a good idea of the, the product shelf life prior to running the other ones. So um, this is a very common question. And so we, it's definitely recommended to do all of them, but we can kind of set up a study to, to look at one initially before moving forward with others. Okay, and I think there's just one more question. Um, this one says, why do I need to do routine storage studies if I've already done them once? So in terms of, you know, doing routine storage studies, you know, things can change over time. So even if you're still with the same supplier, you have similar ingredients, there can still be changes over time. So it's always good just to set up additional studies, you know, down the road so that you're verifying everything. Um, so you do it once and, you know, maybe you're even holding um, the studies, uh, your, your own products internally and evaluating. So at some point, it's just good to run another third party study um, to, to just ensure that the quality and the safety of the product is still continuing to be met. Okay, um, we did have another question come through. If we want to do accelerated shelf life, what are the things we need to consider? Is there any resource? So, I mean, there's a, a number of questions that I have initially when, you know, a client wants to do accelerated shelf life testing. So you need to consider um, your product, you know, how long the, you know, expected shelf life is, and then essentially if it's applicable. Um, if you have the time to do the real-time study, that's definitely recommended um, because it's recommended to do that regardless if you're doing an accelerated study. So, you know, just what are your essentially goals? Like what could be your mode of failure and is that accurately evaluated through acceleration? Um, and will your product remain um, essentially stable under accelerated conditions and not change in ways that typically would not occur um, when held at, you know, say an ambient temperature if your product is shelf stable. Okay, thank you so much, Eric and Heidi. With that, we are out of time for today. Um, but I want to thank everyone again for joining us. If we didn't get your question, please feel free to shoot an email to lab at amtech.com and we'll be sure to get back to you with an answer. We also encourage anyone who's interested in shelf life testing with us to submit an inquiry form on our website so we can schedule a meeting to discuss your needs. 
Thank you again so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in October on the topic of environmental monitoring.